Good afternoon. My name is Walter Kemp. I'm Senior Fellow at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And it's great to have so many of you joining us today in this discussion uh, on tackling organized corruption and monitoring governmental anti-corruption pledges in the Western Balkans. Just a few housekeeping issues. This event is being recorded. It's not being live streamed, it's being recorded. Um, if you have uh, any questions or comments, please put them in the chat as we go, preferably in English, but we can also translate them from uh, the languages of the Western Balkans. Uh, I think our bandwidth is, is big enough that you can keep your screens on as, as we go. If not, uh, feel free to turn off your videos. Please certainly turn off your microphones. Uh, that's very distracting for the speakers. To give you a brief overview of what we're going to do in the next 90 minutes, uh, the main focus is on two recent reports, which you'll hear more about in the moment. We'll have opening remarks by Mr. Lance Dom, who is the deputy head of Western Balkans Department in the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We'll hear from him in just a moment. We'll have a presentation of the two reports by the authors, Mr. Ugi Tsegic, who's senior advisor at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, uh, also EPLO uh, ambassador and professor, and Sunchana Roxandic, associate professor at the Department of Criminal Law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Zagreb. Then the, uh, we'll have a discussion with four experts reflecting on uh, the main findings of the report. We'll hear from Mr. Tomislav Sokol, who is a member of the European Parliament. He's from Croatia. We'll hear from Tim Steele, who's senior advisor uh, for anti-corruption at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. Then Ms. Aneta Arnadovska, who's senior anti-corruption advisor at the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative based in Sarajevo. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Professor Dimitris Silvas, who is professor at the Pantheon University of Athens. We then would welcome any questions or comments. Obviously, if you have any burning questions as we go, please put them in the chat and we'll try and address them. Uh, we hope to have as much of an interactive discussion and tell you all about these two new interesting reports. So to start with, if I could ask uh, Lance Dom to give a few words of welcome. Thanks very much, Walter. It's nice to be here and welcome to all of the uh, participants and guests on the line today. Um, and thanks, uh, first of all, to Global Initiative for organizing this event, Walter and your, and your team really appreciate that. And uh, thanks also to the experts in the Civil Society Observatory for all the work that has gone into these reports. Very grateful for your hard work and, and the passion that you bring to this really important subject. Uh, I should also thank Rachel Chetham and my team who, who leads uh, in the Foreign Office in London uh, for us on this work. So just to provide really briefly some background, um, back in 2018, the UK hosted the Berlin Process Summit in London. And that is where Western Balkans leaders uh, committed themselves to uh, various anti-corruption pledges. And these pledges cover, among other things, public procurement tax issues, uh, whistleblowing, beneficial ownership, asset recovery, law enforcement. So a real range of, of issues where corruption is unfortunately prevalent. But they were, at the time in 2018, of course, just pledges. And we know that implementation is really what, what counts. And implementation is, is, is what is going to be crucial in building resilience to corruption and organized crime and in terms of creating the conditions for wider conditions for prosperity across the region. We know, um, uh, and no one better than uh, the participants on the line today, that corruption undermines national security, prosperity, and diverts resources from where they're most needed. And today we think most obviously of healthcare, but, 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 but other infrastructure as well, of course. And it not only does that, but it prevents business, businesses no, from testing. competing. Ah, yeah. Fairly. Um, so these reports um, highlight the important role that can be played by the private sector in the fight against corruption. That's a really important point, alongside the, the vital work that civil society does uh, to monitor how the governments are doing and how they're honouring uh, their pledges. So the UK government um, firmly believes uh, that cooperation between civil society, businesses and governments, uh, with the help of uh, international cooperation, strengthens the fight against uh, corruption. 
And these, the, these reports will provide a good basis for systematic monitoring of the implementation of the pledges and of uh, informing the delivery of future anti-corruption initiatives. Uh, one such is the illicit finance and anti-corruption roadmap that, uh, that we're working on. Um, and maybe uh, more can be said about that later. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much again to Walter to, to, for hosting us today. Thanks to all the speakers. And I close just by re reiterating uh, the, uh, the fact that the UK will continue to stand with the region of the Western Balkans to uphold the principle of transparency and accountability. So with that, back to you, Walter. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much, Lance. And thanks very much for the support that we get from the UK generally for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, but particularly for our work in Southeastern Europe and for making these reports possible. We'd like to turn now to give you a brief overview of some of the main findings, and we'll share the screen in a moment. So just to give you a, a brief background, uh, we're looking at two reports today, one uh, on the political economy of corruption, uh, another on the anti-corruption monitoring pledges that was just mentioned. And this is part of a series called Infrastructure of Integrity in the Western Balkans, and you can see the cover there. So as was just mentioned, uh, the Berlin process was launched in 2014, and it's designed to facilitate regional cooperation in the Western Balkans and promote European integration and security. There have been a number of summits, and you can see a few of them here. The first one uh, that focused on corruption was in Trieste under the Italian leadership in 2017. And there a joint declaration was issued on common commitments to fight against corruption and exchange information for the verification of asset declarations. This was followed up as uh, was just mentioned by a summit in London in 2018, where the countries of the region made specific commitments to implement anti-corruption pledges. Each country uh, had slightly different pledges, as we'll see, but uh, this was an important high-level political commitment. This was followed up the following year in Poznan in Poland, and uh, that again renewed the anti-corruption commitment and set in motion uh, the importance of monitoring the implementation of these commitments, not least by civil society. Our infrastructure of integrity series is in four parts. The first part came out in October last year. It's the executive summary of the whole series. We're going to be looking at parts two and three today. One is called political economy of organized corruption, and we'll explain what that term means. It's a, a new expression that we use and anti-corruption in the Western Balkans. And the third or the second of the two reports that we'll talk about today is Western Balkan anti-corruption pledges, which goes into considerable detail about the pledges that were made and tracks their implementation. In a few uh, weeks, we'll be coming out with the fourth part, which is on more specific national assessments, including some case studies. The sources for these reports are information and assessments compiled by national experts, and I will introduce them later. I think all six of them are on the call. Uh, from academia, from NGOs, as well as uh, investigative journalism. Some of the information comes from government sources, information that they provide on uh, national assessments of their own progress. And because the pledges also relate to other international commitments through the EU and the UN and so on, we looked at relevant reports that were tracking progress for implementation of EU, uh, Greco, UNODC, and, and Moneyball commitments. We also looked at specific uh, case studies to illustrate different aspects of the pledges, and that will come out particularly in the national reports. I'd like to now hand it over to Ugi to give you uh, some of the main findings. Uh, thank you, um, Walter. Um, I will uh, start this presentation in trying to uh, describe the scenery of corruption in the Western Balkans. And we have what is usually uh, uh, referred to conventional corruption. This is bribery, nepotism, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, these uh, forms of corruption are culturally well entrenched and often go hand in hand with malfunctioning public administration. Often it is very difficult to differentiate what is conventional corruption and what is malfunctioning of public administration. The more worrisome form of uh, uh, corruption or other forms of corruption are what we have termed organized corruption. And that is actually an involvement of a number of uh, interest organizations. They might be criminal organizations, criminal organized uh, uh, groups, or various uh, uh, quite uh, legal organizations, including political parties, including enterprises, state enterprises, private enterprises, clubs, associations, et cetera, et cetera. But they use uh, various forms of corruption and, and related illicit deeds from the position of power and with political coverage to uh, gain financial, political, or social benefits. So definitely speaking, the organized corruption rests on the interwoven criminal, political, and economic interest to profit from the power position and political coverage of illicit deeds. Next, please. Organized corruption, there are, uh, we, we came up with three main types in, in the Western Balkans. One is what we call political uh, financing. It is not only financing of political parties and electoral campaigns, but that is also part of that. But it is also support and ease of access to public goods, to uh, procurement. This is the behind the door public appointments in, in state-owned enterprises or in business network. And that creates an economic and political dependency uh, network. The second one uh, is economic and financial uh, organized corruption. That is particularly symbolized through uh, public procurement, uh, privatization process, which in the Western Balkans had unfortunately almost what we know from the Western movies, a Western type of uh, 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 Western, Western uh, wild Western uh, type of approach, tax evasion, money laundering, and various other sorts of uh, investments and financial illicit deeds. And then finally, we have a more uh, uh, classical uh, sort of organized corruption, and that is illicit uh, enrichment, which can be for personal, but also for organizational uh, purposes. So in Western Balkans, unfortunately, these types of organized corruption are, other, are uh, uh, amply present. Uh, it is also interesting that from looking at this scenario of uh, 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 corruption in, in the region, that we have to know that uh, corruption and organized crime do not belong only to the underworld, to the criminal world. But today, much of it happens into mezzo world. That is on the, this thin edge between illicit and licit. And some of illicit walks openly straight on the promenade. So we also have to know that this is not anymore only a domestic, not even only a regional phenomenon, but rather international phenomenon because the Western Balkans is one of the most important hubs for transnational organized crime and transnational organized corruption. So the anti-crime culture must go beyond the underworld and become a part of the dominant civil culture. The actors I have already mentioned uh, that, that are very much involved in the organized uh, corruption are politicians from the political parties, uh, members of the parliament, domestic and foreign uh, entrepreneurs, that regards management of public enterprises, business, banks, public funds. Unfortunately, also members of the judiciary and criminal justice system, organized crime, 
groups, and finally, uh, members of the public administration, whether on local or on the national level. Government's responses to these challenges, some old and some new, is that they have expressed full commitment to anti-corruption in multiply uh, fora. Most of the countries adopted anti-corruption strategies at the national level, but still we don't have really follow up nor good evaluation of the impact and effects of these anti-corruption strategies. Most legislation in the region comply both with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption as well as with the European Union Arche Communitaire, but still there are many deficiency and loopholes. All the countries have established normative infrastructure to fight corruption, anti-corruption bodies, as well as anti-corruption law enforcement, uh, prosecutorial and uh, ju uh, uh, judicative bodies, but still we have high level of organized corruption cases seldomly being prosecuted and only few have been adequately adjudicated. Sunchana, please take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Uri. Thank you, Walter. Uh, when we are talking about monitoring anti-corruption pledges, let's go back a bit what Walter stated in the beginning, that um, each government of Western Balkan country gave certain pledges uh, that uh, specific anti-corruption measures will be introduced concerning uh, different um, uh, issues. So we divided this anti-corruption pledges into three categories. One particularly concerning the economy and um, um, economic conditions. The other political one concerning exposing, prosecuting and sanctioning um, uh, corruption. And the third one concerning EU uh, regulation, primarily uh, making sure that uh, um, perpetrators of uh, corruption offenses do have uh, immunity. So um, anti-corruption pledges are concrete and our report uh, also tried to be concrete that we specifically followed uh, these issues. Thank you. Based on our assessment and based on uh, several different pledges and available reports, UNODC uh, for EU uh, Greco and um, uh, work of our um, uh, experts and analysis of legislation in each respective state, we can provide you here with six um, um, findings that we do wish to uh, open for um, a discussion with you. So, uh, the, one of the biggest problems that we noticed is even where the anti-corruption legislation is in place, the implementation is not effective. And this is the biggest problem. Uh, although there is quite optimism here because we have legislation present. Um, uh, it's uh, also that the Balkan states showed signs of progress over the last five years, what we monitored, but also several setbacks that are uh, that can be uh, uh, worrisome. Definitely, the culture of integrity is not fully developed, and that is one of the main problems. And we can see it particularly in monitoring um, high-profile corruption cases, which do exist in um, each um, uh, each state. Uh, therefore, it was for us at the end, we didn't have any option but to conclude that organized corruption exists in all Western Balkan countries and significant reform is needed for all stakeholders. We also noticed that the pledges that were given by respective governments uh, were repeated through various reports, meaning that anti-corruption measures introduced are mostly um, um, externally driven, driven by international community and EU, and not enough internally. And, and, as last but not least, of course, uh, we noticed that there is lack of political will. 
rule of law, fundamental rights and governments definitely must be uh, strengthened. We notice that also concerning judicial reforms and the fight against corruption and organized crime and public administration reform really needs to deliver real results. Pledges needs to uh, deliver the real result. uh, results. Can we continue, please? Therefore, uh, I gave you some examples of um, um, anti-corruption pledges. Not all of them do have uh, the same gap. Uh, we uh, decided to to, uh, um, to actually underline listed gaps. So we noticed gaps in public procurement, definitely concerning uh, uh, corruption and anti-corruption measures, financing of political parties and campaign, whistleblowing protection, although the law more or less is in every country, it's not implemented as, uh, as meant. Beneficial ownership and access to information needs even um, uh, sometimes legislation, but definitely it is the area where um, more attention is needed. Impunity and political protection of suspects and, uh, sus suspects and culprits, it's definitely visible, unfortunately, in high profile uh, political um, uh, white collar crime cases. Judiciary, judiciary is not independent as it's supposed to be because it's quite clear without independent judiciary, prosecution and sanctioning of corruption is not possible, especially in high level cases. But that also refers to, uh, in certain countries especially, very weak and non independent anti corruption agencies. Illicit enrichment is also present with uh, sometimes uh, help of certain legal entities and even professionals, including lawyers, notaries, financial and accounting consultants, consultants in concealing um, 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 illicit, uh, illicit funds and definitely lobbying and lack of regulation here is, is not helping in, in um, um, transparency in um, uh, essence. There, therefore, as in other countries as well, not only in Western Balkan, asset recovery and confiscation is a problem even if there is a conviction. Can we continue? Okay. So uh, definitely the main issues on, of anti-corruption in Western Balkans um, do refer to persisting structural short fundings that is particularly worrisome and organized corruption. It's quite clear that we do have link between political white collar crime to organized crime and including business. Uh, lack of independent anti-corruption control structures is omnipresent. Definitely there is a need for further professional and capacity development and as media um, presents an extremely important role in exposing high profile organized corruption, there is not enough um, um, independent media uh, present. The same goes with civil society organization, which are extremely important, although uh, there is extremely good work with some of the civil society organization, there must be more involved um, in exposing corruption, especially since organized corruption is present in, um, in all um, um, illicit country. Uh, I come from academia, but I'm not going to spare academia here as well. Uh, although the research is present, again, the similar could be stated, since organized corruption is so omnipresent, more research on that. A problem is apathy of citizens and brain drain. When apathy of citizens be, becomes uh, omnipresent again, uh, it's very hard to give a new energy to expose and uh, um, get rid of corruption. Therefore, a lack of independent and professional oversight really does not um, help uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, but, um, we as experts are ready uh, to fight, definitely, and um, uh, there are future steps that need to be taken um, that we identified as the most important and open the floor later on for the discussion. Uh, strengthening public civil society partnership is needed. 
public debate on key anti-corruption initiative is needed. In that research, as we do hope that this report also um, is part of in that re research, is definitely needed, particularly into specific corruption issues and ensuring appropriate sanction for corruption-related offenders is needed because law needs to be implemented in practice, then the rule of law is present, and implement the fundamental reforms required to ensure the rule of law, the functioning of democratic institution, independent of judiciary and public administration. Um, as organized crime does cooperate, definitely, it's really, uh, one of the most important issues that regional cooperation between law enforcement is uh, also uh, present. You will find in the reports all four detailed analysis of each pledge. And by that, I would give a floor again to uh, Walter because systematic monitoring of the implementation of anti-corruption pledges is something that is already been working um, uh, on. And by, by that, I would like to end that just giving pledges is definitely not enough and information is needed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sinchan and Ogi. And uh, I think it was Gerald Ford who said when the Helsinki Final Act was signed that we will be judged by the promises that we keep and not just the promises that we make. And I think that very much applies to the anti-corruption pledges. There is uh, already quite a few questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we will get into uh, the discussion with our panelists. But Ugi, I wanted to pick up one before we get too much further. A question from Gergi Vermo. What is the difference between organized corruption and grand corruption? Or is there any difference in that expression? Well, actually, they are very similar. There is not a big uh, uh, difference grand uh, uh, corruption and organized corruption are similar in a sense that they uh, assume presence either of high level figures or of important interest groups that are present. And they may be also both at the domestic and increasingly very much on the international, that is transnational level. Thank you. Great. And uh, just in reference to Michael Levy's point, we're looking particularly in this report at pledges from the Berlin process. And um, these, the headlines that we've been making on, on these, these uh, PowerPoint charts here, these are referring to the overall uh, conclusions, overall observations. But the performance of the different countries is not monolithic. And that's why we've looked very specifically at the pledges made by each country and each country made different pledges under different categories. And they have different levels of how far they've gone in terms of the implementation. So to illustrate that, if we can show you something that we're launching today, this is an online tool which reflects the work that's been done in the report, but is user-friendly and it's something that we can update periodically. There you can see the the headline, if you go in under the Global Initiative website, there's a, a map of the region. We could click on Albania, for example, to go alphabetically, click on the country, and that will take you to an overview. Uh, we won't click on it here, but if you download the full profile, you can see each one of the pledges that was made and what progress has been made so far. So if you scroll down here, we've looked at the indicators from the London Summit, the achievements that have been made as of February 2021 and the challenges that lay ahead. And to give you a concrete example, here are the different categories that the countries made pledges on. Again, not uh, for each topic for each country, but we could click on uh, public procurement and open, open contracting, for example. You can see on the left, um, these are the, the indicators, the pledge topics what they pledge to do. This is what has been done so far. And the third one will show you what remains to be done. So this is something that we think is unique. What we were surprised in our research is that many of the people that we were talking to in official ministries or in civil society weren't aware of the pledges. 
not only the specific pledges, but the, the whole process of making the pledges. And so we think it's very important to have this level of transparency and also to show progress because in many cases, important progress has been made. In other cases, there has been less progress or even backsliding. So this is a tool that's fresh. It's gone up just today. And as we say, will be updated on a, on a periodic level. So we hope that's useful um, to the countries of the region, to civil society, to all of those interested in following the process. And now I'd like to turn it over to our discussants to reflect on some of those main observations that we'd, we've made, but also more generally on the issue of corruption and anti-corruption in the Western Balkans. If we could start with Tomislav Sokol. Sir, you have the floor. Good to uh, see you. Thank you very much. Uh, th I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and obviously also the speakers for very interesting pre presentation, presentations, which I was uh, listening at uh, with great interest. I think uh, this is uh, this is something this is uh, this is something very good. This is a very good initiative, especially since uh, usually we kind of we think of uh, corruption in these parts of the world in kind of intuitive way. But it's good to actually have a concrete, systematic uh, data and to have concrete, systematic research on on, on this and to have a, kind of uh, have a structure on the different types of corruption. I think that is that is very important because it kind of highlights the most important uh, elements that exist. And what is also, I think, very good is the methodology so that we have concrete pledges, but also kind of ways of monitoring and checking what the progress, what type of progress is made. I think this is some, this is a kind of an objective systematic an analysis that we, de that we definitely need. Uh, what was of special interest for me was this structure into three types. So political financing, economic and financial corruption, and illicit, illicit personal en enrichment. Of course, I think that the two, the first two, dimensions are the, the most problematic ones because in these parts of Europe uh, usually uh, when, when we speak of uh, the crucial problem of corruption is the fact that it is deeply entrenched into the state structures. So we mean the, the administration, the political parties, uh, the judiciary. So all of this, so all of this is kind of a systematic problem. So it's not kind of uh, uh, different ad hoc uh, cases which should be merited on an individual basis, but really something which is which is systematic and which shows deeper problems than just individual cases. I think that this is something very important that we can, that we can highlight. So some of the most important things that I, that I picked up, uh, which seem very uh, familiar, is, is the fact that in many cases we have legislation, uh, which sounds good, not in all, all cases, but in many cases this is the implementation, at least partially, of the, Euro of the Euro European Union acquis communautaire, but implementation is the problem. So, uh, so in many, so in many cases, it's, it is these ways to transcribe certain European laws or rules or even. Uh, uh, rules of certain, some member states or even EU, EU legislation, but without real implementation, without the whole uh, framework of uh, making sure that, uh, that the system of implementation is very transparent and that we can actually measure the, 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 the effects on the implementation, the not, not real progress is made. I think this is, this is the first problem. So it's not just a question of making laws, rules, uh, transcribing some things from European Union, but really making sure to create this whole kind of uh, environment where rules can be can be implemented in the best possible way. And of course, what is connected with this, uh, we need to have political will to do this, and this is obviously lacking in many countries. The second thing that I wanted to that I wanted to mention is the problem, obviously, of politics. And politicians make very bad role models. So when people look, uh, and this this goes to the heart of the culture of uh, corruption in, the, in Southeast Europe, where when people see uh, high uh, high uh, high profile cases of corrupt politicians who go to court and then the the prosecution the procedure lasts for ten or fifteen years, kind of everything loses the point. Uh, so, so obviously, so obviously, politicians are not good good role models. And if we want to to show people that actually fighting corruption makes sense, then we have to then we have to make sure that also that the the criminal prosecution ends with the final judgment in a, in some kind of a reasonable time. And then, of course, we have again the problem of the lack of independence in uh, independence in the area of judiciary. But I think what is kind of the overarching issue, and I think that is the main structural problem, is the fact that state in all of these countries is really omnipresent. 
So, uh, so state is so state is uh, everywhere in the economy, in the media, in cultural life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything is connected to the state one way or the other. So, so it's very, very so economy is completely connected with state activities, and this kinds of kind of situation you cannot really work. Uh, in the economy, if you do not have good connections with members with members of the political elite, let's say, so uh, so we don't have a real private entrepreneurship developed in these countries, and without and without this, without people who are really independent of politics, we, you, with the situation where everybody is dependent on some way or the other, either directly by by having businesses with uh, doing business through public procurement with state authorities, but in other indirect ways as well. Well, uh, while we have this kind of a problem, it's very hard to um, to imagine that the problem of uh, this organized structure corruption within the with, which is so deeply entrenched will be will be, will be made better. So I think definitely that we need more in the more independent uh, companies, more independent uh, NGOs, more independent. Uh, economy, which is not, and, and we need a state which is not so uh, involved in in every aspect of everyday life. So this and this is something which is kind of, which is to a large extent left left over from communism, where state was everything. But unfortunately, this was kind of inherited in the new in the in the new countries that 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 we see. And of course, everything is then connected to this: the lack of independent NGOs, the lack of independent media. So everything, as I said, is connected. And some countries, I have to say. Even though that you mentioned that there is overall progress seen, I think that some countries in the last five years have really taken the step, steps back, like Serbia, for instance, where I, I, I remember the situation in the 1990s, for instance, and I never saw such a centralization. Even in those times, which were considered the dictatorship, we, we didn't see such a centralization of power in terms of economic power, political power, uh, media power, cultural power, power in, in the hands of one person or one party. So this is something. So what, uh, as long as we have this kind of a situation where, where, where all of the power is so deeply centralized, where, where everything uh, depends on the decision of one man, that, uh, we will we will we will have a situation which is uh, prone to corruption. So uh, so these these I think are the most important uh, things that that I noticed in in all of these countries. But what about the European Union here? What the, what can the European Union do? I think that is also something which is important. So obviously the, the context is not very good. So you know that we kind of have this um, exo uh, exhaustion of enlargement. So enlargement is not a big topic in the European Union anymore. There are strong uh, opponents, especially individual member states, in terms of uh, in terms of in, in, of enlargement. And uh, we can, and it's and in this kind of a situation, it's very hard to uh, hard to make promises to some of these countries that they will uh, enter the European Union if they satisfy the criteria in five years. <laughs> We have this, so this kind of a situation, it's really hard to motivate and provide incentives for these countries and people within these individual countries to really fight for corruption and try to reform and change the uh, the structures which are which are deeply corrupt as we as we can see. So this is so this is the million dollar question. So how to maintain focus of the European Union on Southeast Europe on one side and to and on the other side how to try to preserve what uh, positive what positive forces are in these countries we uh, in terms in terms of fulfilling european criteria and, and fighting corruption uh, so this is something that i've been also working on i'm a member in the european parliament of the delegation to montenegro turkey and mediterranean so this is so so this is something that i try to also to to put high on the agenda of the european parliament and i'm glad that croatian presidency also uh, was was a presidency which really tried to do a lot in terms of uh, Keeping the process of enlargement alive, especially in terms of starting negotiations of North Macedonia and Albania, and I'm glad that, we, that this this was at least one success. But of course, there is a long way, long way to go here. What I think is what I think in, uh, when you speak of European involvement, which I said is necessary, is also to uh, is that this involvement is really uh, serious, that it is systematic, and that it's based on data, so that you get all the, the relevant information that we need. That this is why these kinds of reports are so important, uh, but also to treat uh, all the countries individually and objectively. I think this is this is most important, so that we do not look at all of these countries in one single box, because there are extreme differences. If some of these countries are barely functioning, some of these countries are, we can say, are protectorates, while on the other hand, some countries, as I said, have reversed back into some, into, 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 uh, into things which are not very, into developments which are not very good. 
so we, we need to, to, to look at each country on its own merits. I think that is that this is very important. And secondly, that we have to have equal criteria for all. So equal, equal criteria based on merits, based on progress, based on results, and one of the most important results is fighting the systemic corruption and not, uh, and not uh, putting geopolitical interests uh, as, as the priority. And I think this is this this is crucial. So if so, if somebody is really uh, honest about uh, about uh, about uh, trying to to fulfill European Union requirements, then European Union should support these kinds of people. But, but only if these if all these politicians like these are saying uh, uh, that that they, that that they support European standards and values, but in reality, the implementation is something completely different, then they should be sanctioned for this. Why I'm mentioning this, I mentioned this because in some countries we can see that other players, uh, apart from the European Union, like Turkey, Russia, China, have had a strong influence in, this, in, in, in the, the last couple of years. I think this interest is actually growing, it's not diminishing. Part of the part one of the reasons part of the reason for this is that European Union is, as I said, is really show, uh, sending messages that it's really not interested in, in, in enlargement as much as before, and this is and this is a big problem, because uh, we have to we have to on one side we have to try to connect these countries with European Union. They are economically uh, dependent on European Union, so 70 to 80 percent of their foreign trade is with European Union, so they are completely dependent on us. But on the other side, we can see that uh, that politicians are using these kinds of other connections with uh, third parties like uh, like China, Russia, and Turkey to actually score some points at their, at their internal level and try to, to play some kind of a balancing game and, and play some kind of a, a new, new non-aligned movement for the 21st century. So I think this is this is not good. We should help the, the countries uh, fulfill European standards, but we should we should also hold them accountable, and we should and we should definitely focus on on these countries being very be, being honest and forthcoming about the European perspective of these countries, and not having and not just uh, saying this uh, de declaratively, but but without real 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 implement, implementation. So to sum up, I think uh, this, the, the, the reports are, are very interesting. They show the systematic problem that, that exists. These systematic problems can only be resolved by political will. And to, to, and to achieve this political will, we, can, we have to put pressure from the European Union in the sense that we uh, reward those who are good, but also sanction those who are not, who are not very good. And to see and also to try to find a way to tackle these foreign influences, which are which are becoming stronger and stronger, stronger than, than before. What is also important is that we have good connections with civil society, with academia, even though the problem of independence also exists in these areas as well, because as I said, the state is so omnipresent, then uh, academia and media are also in many cases not really independent. But uh, we have to we have to uh, see we have to identify those persons that we can work with uh, who can provide us with the best data and who really want uh, countries of southeast europe to to fulfill european union standards and become members of the of the european union and only if, if we look if we if we act together in this way this kind of an honest objective and systematic way can we achieve the, uh, what we want and that is that all of these countries uh, Become some kind of uh, kinds of role models in terms of fighting corruption and to fulfill the necessary European Union standards to become part of the of the European integration. I'm not very optimistic in the short in short term, like say in the next five or six years. I do not think that we will see major progress there. But I I hope that if we maintain this kind of a political will to change and try to and to maintain focus on the Southeast Europe and European institutions that in 10 and 15 years, we can see real, real progress and real differences in, this, in these countries. So again, thank you very much and I'm open to all questions and comments. Thanks very much. And I think uh, you partly answered a question in the chat from Sarah Garrett. She was asking, well, saying that in the Balkan countries, many young people leave the region saying that uh, one of the major frustrations is corruption. What can be done to change their perspective Maybe if, if you could answer in just very short, what would you say to young people in the region today, uh, how not to be um, too pessimistic about corruption or what, what can be done from their part to build integrity? 
Yes, thank you very much. The, big, the, main, the biggest problem is for the young people to see perspective, to see that they can actually flourish in these countries uh, without uh, becoming members of one political party or one interest group, etc. I, th I think this is the biggest, the biggest challenge to really, uh, to really provide them with kind of a perspective that they can, that they know that they can uh, fulfill their, their their dreams, their desires, what, what they want to do with their lives without uh, having to uh, become parts of all of these structures that they need to fight against. So uh, I can tell them, I mean, I can tell them, keep fighting, try to, to organize, uh, try to find uh, allies within the countries and, and outside and we'll try to help. But it's really hard for me to, to say, keep on, uh, to really say, keep on fighting because I know how hard, how hard it is. And in many cases, it's just easier to walk, to walk away and go to other countries. So, but, but I think it is essential to give them this kind of a perspective that they can succeed in life without having to, without becoming part of what, uh, of all of these things that are the problem. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Let's turn now to Tim Steele from UNODC. Tim, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd also like to very much thank you for the opportunity to speak a little bit to you this afternoon, and but also point out that I am a late stand-in for my colleague, Virginia, who works in the region. So please forgive me if I'm not as expert as maybe you would hope. Um, I think the first point to make is all we're seeing Ugi and Sushan reporting very much links into the work we're doing at the moment. We're busy building a sort of future anti-corruption and illicit finance roadmap for the Western Balkan Six linked through the Berlin process. Now, stepping backwards a little bit to say what that actually means is the roadmap is effectively coming together, identifying some priorities that are shared by the countries, all the countries, and then developing very, very granular technical solutions with experts from the countries, taking those granular solutions, putting them in front of high level decision makers, civil society, development partners, everyone, and refining them into a, a series of commitments. The theory behind this is we all hear the story political will, but political will has to be linked to practical reality to actually drive something. We also believe that you absolutely need to focus. I mean, while sure broad the broad legal framework is important, but corruption is a very sort of specific act. It takes someone or a group of people to decide to do something. It's, and it creates schemes and target particular weaknesses within, within the government, even within the private sector, and target those weaknesses to extract some sort of benefit, some sort of illegal rent, some sort of illicit rent. So to actually really get some form of impact, yes, the framework needs to be in place. And I think that's largely true in most of the countries we're covering. But the next stage to us is really to get some agreement on some very granular approaches to actually target what where people are actually taking money, where people are benefiting, and looking at where there is support. So going with the where is the support? I mean, very much our view is there are many people who are fighting for broader political will. We'll leave that to them. We will try and do the technical work. Now, the pr process to create this roadmap is ongoing. And the next phase will be a meeting of technical experts and political level experts first technical and political experts that will be held in North Macedonia in the week of 21 June to actually really decide on the priority areas. Now, I was delighted as Ugi and Sushana presented to see that the priority areas that they were presenting had significant overlap with the priority areas that have come out of our consultations with the governments, with society in the countries. 
one of the strong beliefs is there needs to be government ownership, there needs to be will, there needs to be some sort of desire to do something. Okay, having said that, the very first priority I'm going to throw out at you is corruption in sports, including money laundering, um, linked, linked to sports. There seems to be a broad interest in working in that specific area. And I think that probably fulfills all of Ugi's definition of organized corruption. Um, I think you'll find every single element in there. And indeed, I believe that some Western Balkans representatives have actually been fairly active in developing a, a global guide we're producing on corruption in sport at the moment. Um, second one links very directly what was being, to what was being said, which is procurement in time of emergency, including in the health sector. I mean, really drilling down, using potentially using the opportunity provided by the focus on the health sector following the COVID pandemic to really look at what needs to be done, what, what very real reforms can be made on the procurement system but driven from the health sector. We're seeing this approach work very well in quite a few other countries where very much what we're seeing is sort of adopting, adopting sort of open contracting rules, digitization of procurement processes, et cetera. Now that seems to be an interest there. Um, next on the list really, which is coming out, and we'll only do two or three of these because we can't do everything at once. It needs to be much, but next on the list that comes out is enhancement of asset declaration and conflict of interest systems. And really looking at the need to criminalize the list enrichment and really get these systems right. I mean, I can say this area is a very, very technical area and sort of advances in, in the last years and understanding this area enable a much more technical, proactive approach to actually build these systems, which makes it quite difficult for officials to gather money that they shouldn't have. Next one, I think everyone's talked about this at length, is beneficial ownership. Won't say much. Following, next one is, is um, corruption in the, in the construction center and money laundering through real estate. Um, again, I think that will probably link very closely with these organized corruption. Um, identified, but not sure if it's going to come out exactly, is again the whole asset recovery area, in particular the need to develop non-conviction-based forfeiture norms. So the laws are there, but the actual implementation of non-conviction-based systems needs to be developed. Finally, saw this strongly in Sushana's presentation coming out. It's very specifically the creation of a regional corruption and economic crimes prosecutors network. This would link to a broader global network of corruption and economic crimes prosecutors we were developing as well. But the idea that the countries actually have to work together, that a lot of these crimes move across borders, very heavily recognized. I think it's very much watch this space as to which of these will become the priorities. And really, we all hope to see engagement of civil society. We'll hope to see engagement of society, strong engagement of government in developing really very granular, very structured responses to the areas that are priority. Next stage is really to match those in to existing work and then get going with implementation. And I hope I can be a little bit more optimistic that in the focus areas, I think we can see progress very much more quickly than across the entire waterfront. I think I've probably said enough, um, but it is interesting to note how, the, how this matches to exactly what Ugi and Sushana were saying. Thank you, back to you, Walter. Thanks very much, Tim, uh, especially for giving us a sneak preview of the roadmap and some of the possible topics that uh, might 
be in the focus there. If I could just ask you, uh, Rabindra Kumar Dash has a couple times in the chat made the point that it takes two to tango with corruption. There's the bribe giver and there's the bribe taker. Since you're an expert on corruption uh, internationally, can you elaborate a little bit more on what can be done in relation to, to going after bribe givers and not just bribe takers? Uh, I refer you back to a book that my, like myself and others at the OECD and World Bank wrote in 2010. Um, okay, the bribe giver, obviously bribe giving needs to be criminalized, but more fundamentally, what you quite often see is that the bribe giver is acting for a corporation or for a legal person, and that the actual benefit from giving the bribe is massively greater than the bribe. Um, so there needs to be some work done to take the profit out of giving the bribe. You know, clearly on a low level, you would have someone giving a bribe to get their electricity connected. That's not really what we're interested in. If you're giving a bribe to get a large contract, I mean, you see the construction sector bribe. You want to take all the profit and more out, or compensate victims for damages, or combination of the both, or some sort of fine or some sort of restitution. You want to make sure that the risk to the actual corporate who's giving the bribe is very great indeed. And that then leads into a whole other realm of possibilities, which includes perhaps directors feel that they're immune and the corporate pays the money and the shareholders pay. So shareholders have to work to hold directors accountable for this type of behavior. Then you've got corporate compliance regimes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could talk this for days, but one slight correction in the base premise. If we're talking bribery, yes, there's always a giver and a taker. But remember there's also embezzlement, which could be, which is also a corruption offense which could be a single person crime. Great, thanks very much, Tim, for that clarification. Okay, let's turn to our third discussant, Aneta Arnaudovska from the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative based in Sarajevo. Aneta, please. Uh, thank you, Walter. So thanks for inviting uh, Rai uh, at the promotion of these very important uh, publications as valuable sources of knowledge about the situation of the implementation of the anti-corruption pledges uh, and of course the Berlin process uh, in the countries of the Western Balkan. Uh, I will not speak very much about the role and the mission of the RAI because you know all very well what uh, we work, uh, that we work uh, both uh, for public sector, for enhancing the capacities of the public sector and the civil society, and for the next plan, uh, planning period, uh, RAI will work uh, uh, focused uh, on the implementation of the international treaty for the exchange of uh, data uh, on, uh, for verification of the asset declaration signed by the first three states uh, that are Serbia as depository, uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia. Of course, we have a very long process ahead, uh, not only for implementing of this uh, uh, of this treaty, but also to attract the other states to accede to the treaty as powerful anti-corruption tool for revealing the Ill illegal enrichment and promotion the integrity of the public officials. Uh, also in uh, the projects, uh, the regional project on whistleblowing, uh, uh, the European Union project, uh, we will further our cooperation in, we will advance the partnership with uh, another uh, uh, subjects uh, we will include uh, activists, youth, uh, also uh, chambers of commerce and, and uh, academia. And uh, also uh, the, we will, uh, fee, uh, we will uh, have the sectoral approach in implementing the corruption risk assessment and corruption proofing of legislation. Uh, that we think that it's, uh, it's very important for having uh, concrete results in the implementation of these tools and for measuring the, the impact assessment. Uh, 
Uh, I will just say that for the, the needs of this project, uh, we conducted a desk research uh, trying to identify, to map the sectors most prone to corruption in the Western Balkans and widely in Southeastern Europe. So uh, here are health sector, police, judiciary, political parties, customs, education, privatization, construction, and of course, in all sectors, almost all sectors as horizontal uh, sections, uh, public procurement, politization of the recruitment in the public administration. Uh, well, what is very interesting, we uh, find, found out that in almost all of, of these uh, indicated sectors, usually there is the excessive use of shortened parliamentary procedures that prevents the process of open and inclusive legislative process, including the civil society, and of course, uh, uh, hampers the efficient corruption proofing of legislation. Uh, I, will, I will stress several points uh, in relation to the uh, European accession process, uh, but uh, not only in my capacity as uh, uh, part of the RAI secretariat, but also as a former judge and a person being involved for many years in the judicial reforms, strategy reforms, uh, uh, with a focus on the judicial training, not only in North Macedonia, but as well in the, in the countries in the, in the Western Balkan. Uh, so what can we say? Uh, we can say that there is uh, this process, uh, European Union approximation process is a back and forth process. And uh, where can we see our role as regional organizations in this process? How can we help the, the countries? How can we assist the, the states and as well as experts? Uh, so uh, we face the obvious discrepancy between the proclaimed and exercised uh, political commitment uh, in the practice by the politicians uh, as a flagrant example of lack of political will for fight, for fight against corruption. Uh, so this is one of the main obstacles in achieving sustainable project goals that RAI face. And for example, because of that, RAI in the future uh, should mitigate against these changes at the lower levels in the institutions, leading to, lo to loss of institutional knowledge, uh, to invest in human potentials, through promoting the anti-corruption knowledge, education, resources, networking, uh, to train broader pool of trainers and to invest more in monitoring and evaluation skills. RAI also recognizes the need for boosting a new energy and renewed motivation in the approximation process in the areas of anti-corruption. Uh, the reforms have become almost sterile, I would say, because of the brain drain of the young population and the situation of the fatigue of the long lasting approximation process. So latest vocabulary of the North Macedonian politicians, for example, after the Bulgarian veto, is that Europe, uh, if, we, uh, if, you, if, if we cannot reach Europe, uh, then we will bring Europe home. Uh, that is not a very convincing argumentation for the mindful population and for the practitioners uh, in, in the field. Uh, here also, I think that the Berlin process should uh, search for new modalities, for new energy, for new channels, how to approach the states in the region, the candidate countries, especially to more targeted technical assistance of the European Commission, in the implementing of the new enlargement methodology that we must admit that is very demanding and requires sophisticated and advanced skills of the public institutions for monitoring evaluation of the reforms, especially in the sectors most prone to, to corruption. In the next period, RAI will be deeply engaged in the promoting the judicial integrity in general, and more specifically in the criminal justice system. Uh, so uh, we face uh, the situation of crisis of the, of the judicial integrity, crisis of the integrity of judges and prosecutors. And I think that too frequent use of this uh, term, uh, integrity, integrity, all speak about integrity resulted in its uh, vulgarization because we face the widespread situation 
were was deeply involved in conflict of interest, for example, judges and prosecutors, they, they speak up about honesty, integrity, uh, ethics, independence, and so on and so on. So we need to, to, to repeat once again, what does it mean, the integrity in general, and especially in the, in the judiciary. It is important to enhance the preventive mechanisms uh, of corruption, of judicial corruption. We must admit that there is judicial corruption and to develop very specific sectoral anti-corruption and integrity policies in the judiciary in cooperation with the anti-corruption agencies and the civil society. Whether the salaries, the, the, the good financial condition of the, of the prosecution uh, offices is a prevention to corruption, I will say no. Because, for example, the special prosecutor office in North Macedonia in 2019 had an annual budget of 3.7 million euros, out of which 2 million were dedicated for external consultants, you can imagine. Vis-a-vis, -vis, in comparison, with a 4 0.6 million for all other 26 prosecution offices. And at the end, we all face the situation that, of course, it's now first instant ju uh, judgment. I will not enter because of the presumption of innocence. But this is also indicated in the, in the all progress reports that the special prosecutor is uh, uh, adjudicated and convinced to a, a prison sentence of six uh, years. Uh, integrity, integrity crisis and the etiquettes like Swarovski judiciary, and I don't know, captured courts, captured judges, uh, all these allegations of widespread corruption of the judicial system should be investigated, but not to be dealt with drastic measures for general re-election vetting, because also the Venice Commission stated in its opinion that vetting is a measure of last resort and requires very specific conditions. Uh, so also we need to consider all hot issues like trial monitoring, uh, whether we need foreign judges and prosecutors in the criminal chambers, vetting, illustration process of judges and prosecutors, integrity checks, but we need to admit that we should not refer to the examples, similar examples from the region in the Western Balkans, because uh, one size does not fit all. So all these measures need to be adapted to the specific conditions of the, of the countries. Uh, in relation to the criminal justice chain, uh, the situation of impuni impunity, uh, huge corruption scandals uh, without having uh, final court judgments. Uh, so requires the corruption risks in the criminal justice chain to be very seriously identified at the points where the police, prosecutors and judges exercise discretion. And in my opinion, uh, it's very difficult, but, but we need to, to make efforts to find how to draw the line between the inconsist inconsistencies and lack of clarity of criminal, for example, substantive and procedural issues, uh, professional mistakes, lack of quality, and on the other side, the corruption of judges and prosecutors. So which, uh, where, is, where is the thin line between the unprofessional behavior and corruption or in, in um, uh, uh, conducting uh, the um, interesting on a high profile corruption cases. So we need to see where are the deviations for the regular, regular professional behavior of the judge acting under political pressure, or for me is more dangerous if the judges act in a situation of self censoring due to the social political situation. Also to explain the institutional and behavior factors that generate corruption at several levels, at individual levels, at the levels of the president of courts and the self-governing bodies in the, in the judiciary, and as well to identify the external corruption risks and political pressure over the decision-making process. In these cases, we faced in, in North Macedonia several uh, strange uh, situations where the, the ex-president uh, 
uh, adopted a decision for pardoning of 56 suspected in, in criminal cases in 2016. Uh, then he stepped back, but uh, the accused persons in these cases initiated procedures in front of the European Court of Human Rights. So what are we doing now with these cases? Uh, also interference of other powers and institutions in the decision making process, very strange decisions, for example, of parliamentary committees for waiving or not waiving the immunity of certain politicians, which has as a result hampering the, the criminal procedure and so on and so on. So I will agree with uh, Ugi and Sunchana and, and, and the other uh, panelists that we need to uh, to pay a lot of efforts in these uh, surveys, how to identify this risk, to identify the mitigation strategies and measures, and never give up because it's a it's a it's a long-standing process. So it's my opinion, partly my opinion, partly on behalf of the right. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, that really gave us a, a good oversight into the nitty gritty of this issue. And if I may, there's a question uh, that was put in the chat by uh, Ewan Grant a little earlier, and he's asking, are law enforcement su uh, suitably aware and trained to investigate grand corruption to criminal prosecution standards? What is your view on that? Uh, when we come to law enforcement officials, because they are also part of the criminal justice chain together with the uh, with the prosecutors and judges, uh, it uh, it is very important to uh, to to implement first the Greco recommendations coming from the fifth uh, round evaluation. Uh, that in some is of course depolitization of the police because the uh, especially in the advanced career the procedure of vetting in the police. Uh, uh, performance evaluation, rotation of the staff, and training also training, uh, especially for the for the leadership, because leadership should uh, show the 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 culture to promote the culture of uh, independence, of uh, integrity, and zero tolerance to to corruption. So I think for the law enforcement official, it's important to. Uh, to work parallel on the promoting of individual, but as well uh, as well organizational uh, culture, and of course cooperation with prosecutors, because all our countries in the Western Balkan uh, adopted the prosecutorial investigation. Uh, I'm afraid of the very very large uh, power of the prosecution of the prosecution uh, prosecutors in our countries vis-a-vis -vis the, the defense lawyers. So we need to think, think a lot on, on how to, to strive this proper balance and especially judges should, uh, should lead this process for promoting the integrity and to respect the fair trial requirements uh, uh, ensuring in the case law of the, of the Strasbourg court. Mm -hmm. So, so the police officers are only the, the one part of the chain. Sure, yep. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. And last but not least, Dimitrius Silvas, professor at Pantheon University of Athens, to sum everything up and give us a positive sense of direction for the future in 15 minutes or less. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Walter. Um, let me also thank um, the Global Initiative uh, for inviting me to contribute. Um, one must point out as an um, academic, as an expert in, in corruption and both anti-corruption, that it is the first time um, that we have a follow-up, a, a research uh, outcome uh, to the Berlin process, uh, because the Berlin process is more, more or less uh, has a political basis. So we're talking about pledges, promises made, uh, but um, it's the first time that we are uh, focusing on implementation uh, of this um, uh, political process. Uh, and it, is, um, it comes with great satisfaction that the global initiative against a transnational organized crime decided to focus and implement such a project. And it could also find a sponsor, a donor uh, in the UK government to support 
the great work uh, conducted by our two colleagues, uh, Ambassador Ugi Svekic and uh, Professor uh, Sunsana um, um, Roxandic. So it's, it's great for the academic uh, world and also for researchers uh, worldwide to, to get their hands on the outcomes of those uh, two reports. Um, there is a lot, that we must point out the significance um, of these reports. Uh, the six countries uh, in focus, uh, Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia are all EU candidate countries. It, it has been said in the panel. I come from Greece. Greece is both a member state uh, of the European Union, but we are also neighbors directly or indirectly with these countries. So I must say that the outcomes of this research project uh, uh, do not come as, um, uh, as a surprise to me, being uh, Greek. Um, it is very important. Uh, all these countries uh, are being assessed. There are accession requirements. And as we all know, accession requirements uh, include uh, the rule of law and anti-corruption. Um, so starting from a political, uh, so to say, motivation to conduct um, this uh, project, um, allow me to say that um, I see uh, another great significance uh, in the focus of the project, not just the regional focus, but also the substance. Um, the, the research, the two reports uh, focus on modern trends of corruption and anti-corruption. Uh, trend is a substantial one, and I know that Ambassador uh, Ugi Svekic uh, has pointed out in his work in the past. This is the link between organized crime on one hand and corruption on the other hand. So we're talking about organized corruption. This must be pointed out. So we're looking at corruption perpetrated, committed by organized criminal groups. This is very important. Um, and the other thing is that all recent anti-corruption trends um, are being considered in these two reports. So the two reports do focus on political immunity, which is a very important issue in the Western Balkan region, whistleblowing, from, which is also from an EU point of view and the recent legislation point of view is so important, beneficial ownership, which is so important for infrastructure projects and due diligence uh, procedures, public-private partnerships. So many projects in the region are currently implemented through PPP um, vehicles. Uh, asset recovery, also very important. And another uh, issue which is um, very important for me personally as a criminal lawyer, illicit enrichment. enrichment. Uh, when we talk about illicit enrichment, we must think of um, an unreasonable a growth, uh, let's say, of capital gains, which cannot be justified, explained uh, by the individual. Um, we know about in the UK, um, there are the unexplained wealth orders, for example, which are similar to this thing. And we, we should also keep in mind that illicit enrichment um, in uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, it is uh, not a mandatory uh, offense. So um, member states are not obliged to criminalize illicit enrichment. It's an optional offense. So this um, is very important uh, for the region. For example, currently as we speak, Greece uh, does not criminalize illicit enrichment. So the findings uh, of the reports are very important um, from an illicit enrichment uh, point of view. Um, having said that, I would also, um, it, uh, as two commentators, um, rightly pointed out, uh, Tomislav has said, point of all, the six countries should not be considered as one block. I wanted to point this out. So this is not one block. And as Aneta just pointed out, one size of anti-corruption policies does not fit all six countries or other neighboring countries. Uh, but uh, if we look at the six countries the indicators, the achievements, and the challenges, most importantly, because this is, from my point of view, the most important contribution of the report, the challenges uh, in, in this table. Um, there are some common denominators for corruption and anti-corruption. Um, 
So there is a takeaway uh, for both uh, policymakers, for academics, for international organizations doing work in, in the Western Balkans. And if I may sum up these common denominators, um, first of all, there is limited implementation. So we have a lot of law in books, but limited law in action sometimes in these six countries. Um, there is a lack of in-depth qualitative assessment of these policies. So we need such research as we can find in these two reports. And even more research must be conducted. So we must be able to measure the impact of the policies. Uh, and of course, it all, come down, it all comes down to political will. I, th I think we must, we can all agree, having read those two reports and having heard to the panelists today, that there is a lack of political will in the Western Balkan region to implement anti-corruption measures. Uh, that's why we, we speak of one step forward and two steps back. Um, and I think uh, in terms of um, way forward that uh, the academic community and the civil society should put pressure on uh, local governments and national uh, administration uh, to implement um, some of the policies uh, as identified in these two reports. Um, I'm not sure if, if the projects uh, were uh, kicked out, um, started, were designed when the COVID um, pande pandemic started, but uh, I know for sure that the two reports uh, could not come to a more important and convenient from an anti-corruption point of view time. Um, because um, the, COVID, the COVID pandemic um, uh, is, uh, is putting uh, public procurement to a test, emergency procurement. Uh, and um, the COVID pandemic has also is, is a stress test, if I may so, say so, for both public financing and uh, corporate finances. So um, both countries and corporations are very vulnerable as we speak to corruption and organized corruption. And um, there is another trend that is the digitization of economies and finance. Uh, we've been doing so much e-commerce, so much e-banking, shadow banking, cryptocurrencies, bitcoins. Uh, all this has been accelerated. Uh, by, by the COVID uh, pandemic. So um, one should use, I would say, the findings of those two reports and read the findings of those two reports under the light of the current trends and challenges uh, in corruption and anti-corruption. In terms of the way forward, because we, we should conclude um, today's discussion uh, with, a way, with a way forward. Um, indeed, um, um, as uh, our, uh, our panelists pointed out, uh, the EU enlargement process uh, seems to be stalled, so we're not traveling as fast as we used to. But this does not influence uh, the findings of the reports and the significance of the reports, because there are many stakeholders to anti-corruption, for anti-corruption in, in the region. So one should think of civil society organizations, of course, public government, national governments, regional and international organizations, OECD, United Nations, uh, FATF, Council of Europe, International Monetary Fund. So for all those organizations, there are findings in these reports, which are very useful. And very importantly, last but not least, the private sector. The private sector, because the Western Balkans are a point, a location for investment, not just for the European Union or the UK as, as a third country, but also for China, also for the US, for other big countries. And investors nowadays want to invest responsibly. So taking the sustainable development goals under consideration because they have to report back to their shareholders. So I see a lot of value and a lot of important findings uh, in these two reports, uh, both for the public as well as for the corporate uh, sector. And uh, if I might say so, I would urge uh, the big community that also participates 
uh, in today's discussion. I, we have almost reached 200 participants. Uh, I see a need uh, for a network of experts, uh, that being uh, judicial um, uh, members of the judiciary, uh, of academia, of, of civil societies, because this will be the driving force uh, for change, and this will be the driving uh, force um, if we are to keep the momentum of the Berlin process uh, alive. So I, I believe that this momentum uh, should be maintained, if not strengthened, and the uh, energy and the driving force behind that are academia, um, members of the judiciary, civil society, building networks and pushing governments for implementation, for uh, transparency, for accountability, uh, for uh, integrity. Um, uh, this is all uh, from me as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, um, uh, Walter, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Demetrius. And I have to say you made my job very easy because you summed up the report and gave us that uh, future perspective. And uh, I want to stress particularly to the uh, lady from Montenegro who put the comment in the chat that the anti-corruption pledge uh, monitor is very much a living document. So the idea that we want to put it online is that we can update it as countries uh, make changes, as their developments. So we would very well, very much welcome uh, any feedback that you have on uh, the, the uh, assessment of Montenegro, and we will reach out to you on that. But the, the point of this report is not to sit on the shelf. The point is to actually make a, a difference in terms of policy. And as Demetrius was saying, uh, we see this as an opportunity to, uh, to keep that momentum going, the important process uh, that was initiated uh, in, in Trieste and then London uh, is something that we, we feel can have momentum, but would need a number of stakeholders. And uh, we're very glad that so many people joined the call today. We're almost over, but I do want to give uh, Yelena Perovic the chance to have the floor. Her hand is up, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Marina Michinovic, but the name uh, here that you see is uh, the name of our director of the agency. She was sitting next to me, but she had to leave, unfortunately. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to take part in this webinar with so many participants, especially since I must admit, I'm not proud of that, but I wasn't aware of the Global Initiatives work. Uh, and now I see this is the beginning of our future cooperation. Uh, since we are very much involved in different uh, monitoring mechanisms, monitoring organizations that tackles the work of, the, of Montenegro and also the work of, of the Western Balkan countries. And uh, apart from this technical question, thank you for, for answering this question, because I think it, it is important to, to reflect, to, to actually give you uh, some information that are, you know, are not in line with these inconsistencies that we found in the report, especially since this report already has been published in the media, some parts of it, and we really much, uh, we are really much focused on changing the perception, especially of, of our agency, because we definitely had challenges in, in, in the past. And so to avoid this kind of, of some factual inconsistencies, maybe in the future, we suggest just to have pre preliminary consultations be before publishing the report so that we can avoid this kind of, let's say, uh, uh, unnecessary damage in, in the media. And uh, from a substantial point of view, uh, it is also some of the thoughts that we had. Is it really more important to, to emphasize some general, uh, general conclusions of the region uh, that actually raises some commonalities between the countries Western Balkan Six, or to specify, uh, uh, to, to, to emphasize some specificities of each of the countries in the region so that we can share the know-how? For example, for, for us, it would be more beneficial to know what are the strengths in North Macedonia, for example, so that, and at the same time, maybe those are our, our weaknesses in Montenegro and vice versa, and to exchange this view. For example, in Montenegro, control of financing of political entities from 2016 is already at a certain level. Maybe in North Macedonia, they're only at the beginning of this process, so we could, we could share a certain experience and vice versa. In North Macedonia, 
the academia is so much involved in the anti-corruption matters, which is not the case in Montenegro. So um, I see that for us in the region, it would be more beneficial to, we have the same priority, and this is the fight against corruption, uh, but the first phase of our fight is to uh, make institutions and certain areas that are on the front line in this fight uh, stronger, and then to tackle regional problems in terms of uh, corruption and organized crime, which is definitely crossing the national boundaries. So, for example, certain strength in Montenegro is other countries may be weakness. So this is the way to, to, to reach this convergence and the minimum of standards between these countries. So this is something that is like a food for thought and maybe for some other uh, opportunity discussion, uh, because when you say in the report, there is a conflict, there is often a conflict between jurisdictions, uh, between anti-corruption agencies and law enforcement agency and the judiciary in, in Western Balkan countries. Out of that sentence, we don't have anything in terms of analytics, because we in Montenegro don't have that kind of problem. We have the problem that the public doesn't perceive very much these differences in jurisdiction. Maybe that challenge is pertaining to, to another country's, uh, other country uh, uh, in a greater manner. So I think out of general, general conclusions, and commonalities, we, I don't think we could benefit more unless we specify certain challenges in, in, in these countries. And uh, also uh, what I wanted to say, uh, I, I also had, uh, for example, uh, international treaty that Aneta mentioned that, that was uh, signed by Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia and also negotiated in 2019 by these countries, something that is also, uh, it wasn't reflecting correctly in the, in the, uh, in the report. So um, I think uh, this is just the shift of the, of the focus, maybe on certain specificities, rather uh, not on the general conclusions of the region. Uh, and uh, also anti-corruption pledges from London Summit at, at the technical level, we were very much participated in drafting these recommendations. Uh, now, tomorrow we have a meeting with UNODC uh, representatives as, uh, because UNODC is now secretariat of this process of the monitoring of implementation of anti-corruption pledges, but now also we have a parallel uh, and simultaneous process going on from the global initiative. So we need also to coordinate these, uh, these activities and better match them uh, uh, rather and not have the duplication or overlapping of the process. So uh, this is just, you know, uh, at a first glance and uh, I appreciate that you allow to send certain comments on the report uh, because I saw, for example, that you use the Greco compliance report the first compliance report, not the second, but just for the sake of the clarity and the, uh, of, of information. So th thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I have to say, I agree with pretty much everything that you've said. And I think that uh, it's great that we have these kind of discussions. Uh, I stress that this is a civil society report, but we did try to reach out to government interlocutors, but I also take your point that we need a, a joined up approach between UNODC, the global initiative, and the countries themselves uh, in the context of, of the Berlin process, and I think that opportunity will be there. So our, our uh, desire is to be constructive, to be accurate. Uh, if there's anything that we got wrong, please let us know. And I also very much take your point that we need to focus on the individual uh, countries. Other people made this point that we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think that's the beauty of the pledges. Every government focused on different areas that they want to focus on, uh, but that's also what we're trying to uh, reflect in the pledge monitor, is that these countries are not competing with each other. They're trying to implement certain pledges that for them are priorities. So thank you very much for, for your intervention. Thanks to all of those of you who have participated. I'd like to also acknowledge Chrisella Hakai from Albania, uh, Professor Eldan Mojanovic from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Dejan Milovac from Montenegro, Slagjana Tosova from North Macedonia, Miedrag Milosalajevic from Serbia, and Mentor Vrajoli from Kosovo. 
I'd like to thank our discussants. I'd like to thank uh, the United Kingdom uh, for making this possible. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank our presenters today. And I encourage you, if you haven't done so already, please check out the reports, please check out the online monitoring tool. And this is obviously a process to be continued. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will have an interesting report coming out on the 10th of May, looking at the flows of money, people and migrants through the Western Balkans. And on the 18th of May, we'll be coming out with a report on commercial sexual exploitation of children in the Western Balkans. So please keep an eye on the Global Initiative website. Thanks very much. Stay well and good afternoon. Bye-bye.